everybody for um, supporting the festival and supporting our discussions the way you have. Um, as Virginia said, this is uh, the first time we've done it this way out of necessity. And I, I think it's been quite nice and, uh, and, and quite successful. This is our um, final evening. And, and so I, I want to thank again everybody who worked so hard to put this together. Um, Jack, Virginia, Gail, Maureen, uh, and, uh, and everyone else who was involved. Um, I, I would thank all the speakers. Uh, thanks to Rachel for speaking the other night. Thanks to Jack. Thanks to Roy for tonight. Thanks to Gail for speaking. Thanks to me for speaking. It, it, it's, okay. So, um, to, <laughs> sorry. To, tonight is tonight is our our last night, and and uh, the film was all see, and I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I'm very pleased um, to introduce Roy Holler as our discussant tonight. Roy, um, if you don't know, is the newest addition to the Center for Jewish Studies. He completed his uh, PhD in comparative literature at the uh, Indiana University just last spring. Um, and he is very well situated to discuss this movie because his dissertation and his interests are in the subject of passing. And that is uh, how we pass as others, and he's uh, sort of onto something in a comparative approach by looking at the Israeli literature on passing and African American literature on passing, and, and seeing what it is uh, that they have in common and how they cross pollinate. Um, but the Wait, theme, Norman, Norman the passing has nothing to do with basketball passing. I, I thought that's the, what we the had other to... the other passing. Um, Thanks, Jack. Um, and in any event, with that, I, I, I think I'll turn it over to Roy um, to discuss the film. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. I'm, I'm truly honored to present this film, um, the last mo movie of this very successful festival. Uh, you know, for a first uh, run as 100% virtual, I, I think it was, uh, it was tremendous. Um, I also think it's a fitting closure. Uh, you know, this film we'll be discussing tonight, kind of a full circle uh, uh, back to Florida, because Olsi Perry graduated from a college just across the street here in uh, Daytona Beach. Uh, so before we begin, um, I just I would like to disclose that you know I have absolutely zero knowledge in anything sports. Um, in preparation for this event, I um, I research and learn that in basketball one must uh, um, shoot a ball through a hoop to gain points over the opponent team. <laughs> um, but that that's about it, Norm. I know that you are. Um, a fan, um, a sports uh, enthusiast. So please, if, if you know, feel free to intervene if I mess something up. <laughs> I don't know why you would think that. But go okay, ahead. <laughs> uh, maybe some something in the back of my mind. But anyway, yeah. So better resort to Google if you have any sports related uh, <laughs> question. Um, but yeah, luckily I grew up in Israel, and this movie centers not just around a sports event, but but really a key historical event. Um, and even though before my time, and there's no way to get around Maccabi Tel Aviv, right? The, the team of the nation, um, or as some like to say, uh, you know, for, for a, a, a sometime a nation that, a team that had a nation. Um, and I can talk about it a little more uh, in the evening. Um, and, but but they, they were everywhere, you know, the, these were the days of, uh, you know, God forbid, only one channel on, on TV. I mean, can you imagine that? Um, and if Maccabi was playing ball, I mean, everybody, that, that was what everybody was watching. Um, and Olsi is, you know, it's, it's, it's a great sports movie and, and a very interesting document for those who were not aware of the Maccabi Tel Aviv escapades among the, the Gentiles. You know, I, I mean, whoever imagined that a group of, uh, of Jews can run around a, a basketball court shooting hoops. I mean, it sounds like, um, a lost Mel Brooks skit or something like that. And, and not to mention actually being good at it, right? Even, even winning an international championship or, you know, or two or three or four, it's lost count. Um, the, the game that kind of in, in the center of the film, that famous game against Moscow in 77, you know, was more than just a game. It was really uh, um, the revenge of the Jews on old Europe. Uh, it was like the Hebrew version of, of you know, of, of Jesse Owens in, in the Berlin Olympics. It was, it was this national victory. Um, and, and 
like Tal Brody said, you know, Tal Brody, Olsi's teammate, Anachnu um, Alamapa, right? We are on the map. Um, and, and his American Hebrew was like, Anachnu uh, Bamapa, Anachnu Nisharim Bamapa, Lorak Besport Bakol. You know, and, and I guess what put Israel on, on the map, right, what it took to put Israel on the map was, um, like Yitzhak Rabin said in, in the film, is Israeli ingenuity and, and a little help from, from America, right? And, and this, this help was, was Olsi Perry um, or Elisha Ben Avraham, uh, right? He was, he was drafted to play in Maccabi Tel Aviv um, after this middling career um, in the US and, and in Europe. And I'm not sure if it was the conversion to Judaism that made him, you know, such a sensational player overnight, um, or maybe the fact that he's you know, six foot ten man in, in a nation that's averaging five foot and a half. Um, but but this or that, Osi Berry you know, really became this household name, not just an amazing basketball player who helped Maccabi become champions, but but really a Hebrew dictionary definition to you know, a very tall man. I mean, seriously, tall people in Israel will be referred to as Olsi Perry's. Um, as we learn in the movie, uh, he was a um, local celebrity. I mean, he still is. Um, it's hard to not spot him in the streets of Tel Aviv. You know, you saw when Olsi visits Shuka Carmel, he owns Shuka Carmel, right? Uh, um, Perry was also Israel's first famous foreigner. I mean, was, he was the only foreigner at the time. Uh, um, today, Maccabi Tel Aviv, I think, has maybe two Israeli players, and all the others are foreigners, and, and they come and go every year. They don't leave such a mark like, uh, like Olsi did. Um, I think the film was very gentle, very loving film. And you know it's done with with great respect and admiration to to the man who is really way past his glory days, right? Past his prime, he was a star, but he was a star in a very small provincial and somewhat ethnocentric country. And and then he crashed, and he crashed pretty hard. Um, you know we. The movie shows the usual kind of archival footage, um, some animated dramatizations of events and, and the kind of the must haves, you know, of, of classic sports movies, moments of victory and, and fall from grace um, in this kind of tribute that is um, romantic and, and, and safe. Um, Israel loves its nostalgia. And um, if you don't know the story of Olsi, I, I, I think there, you know, there's pretty, there's a lot there to keep you engaged. Um, Basketball aside, I think some of the most genuine moments in the film show up through portrayal, the portrayal of Olsi's second life in, in America, right? The interviews with his sister, um, his son kind of getting to know his estranged daughter. Suddenly Olsi comes out as, as a private person with, with normal people relationships, um, you know, disappointments and excitements. And I, I think this is the one thing I wish that there were more of. Um, same with his relationship to Tommy ben -Ami, which is a mysterious and not fully realized person in this movie. Um, and I think we can, we can probably talk about it um, a little more in discussion. Um, there are many aspects of this film that you know, present uh, fascinating, fascinating challenges of Israeli society and culture. Um, the story behind Olsi, you know, it's, it's not just a sports movie, it's, it's the story of immigration and assimilation. Um, it's a tale about race and Jewishness and how these come together or, you know, or not in, in this small place that is not so famous um, in its ability to accept the other. Um, you know, we see in the film that Olsi was a, a, a key part of a nation's history, yet he always remained on the margins, right? Being an African-American, being a, a Black tall man, being a convert Jew. Um, uh, I felt through the film that there were, um, you know, that Israel was there for Osi when it needed him, but it was not there to pick him up when he fell down. So it's a bittersweet film. And I think at this point, I will open it up for, um, for discussion and, and, and take comments, um, questions, and, you know, ob observations. Um, so yeah, please, the, the arena uh, is yours. Yeah, Jack. 
I think you're you're muted, Jack. Can't hear you. Jack, uh, yeah. you you're looking at one of the great experts on sports here. So good. Our, good. <laughs> <laughs> I have a book on it on Jews and sports, and I really know nothing about sports, <laughs> and I care nothing about it. But, it's like but you have a I, book. <laughs> I have a book. <laughs> but, the, but one thing that I do know, and that is that Jews and basketball do have an intimate relationship. Okay. And it's interesting, but Jews, Jews it, were, cons this was the Jewish sport in America in the 50s, 40s and 50s, and, and no one could really understand it. So some sports writers at the time assumed that there was a racial dimension to it, that there was some, it was either because there's some vertigo thing that Jews have that make them able to play in, the, in that kind of way, um, or it's because of um, cunning. Jews are particularly cunning, and basketball involves a lot of cunning. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in as a little bit of, information, useless information. Right. <laughs> I'm um, becoming more of an expert on, on basketball because of my time at UF. I think I've, I've attended more basketball games uh, now that I'm part of Gator Nation than, than you know, my whole life before. But um, I'm curious if I don't, I don't know if I wasn't watching closely enough the, the last third of it, but did, did you, Roy, or others feel like they ever heard um, Olsi acknowledge that that they didn't that he didn't feel like he fully belonged in Israel I mean it seemed like an, a subtext like like you were saying the fact that they they were kind of mm -hmm. quick to desert him once there was that line somebody said where you know in in Israel he was like this star but but in America he's like this kind of black drug dealer guy he got cast in that role and they weren't there to stick up for him then but does he acknowledge that gee I thought I had a place there but then I guess in the end you know whether it was race or whether it was sort of not being quite Jewish enough really to Israelis um is his how you know how does he uh, ever come to terms with his insiderness or outsiderness there? If he does, I'm curious if I just didn't, I didn't think I caught it in the film. I don't know if other people found moments when he seems to acknowledge, you know, mm -hmm. what that was like. Well, I mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. no, sorry. I, I mean, I, I think you got it wrong because he, 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 he seems to be accepted. Uh, he, you know, and in fact, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, he decides to stay in Israel permanently, even after his life fell apart. Uh, once he gets out of prison, he's back in Israel and he remarries uh, uh, an Israeli woman and he's got an, another Israeli, an Israeli family. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that, you know, the film doesn't suggest that he didn't fit in. On the contrary, it suggests he, he does fit in despite being like, you know, how tall he was and being African-American and so on. It's, so I, it's odd from that standpoint. Certainly so doesn't explore the, the misfit dimension. Mm -hmm. I, I have to agree. And I thought it did it um, slightly less than implicitly by concentrating on the racism in the US. Mm -hmm. um, because it made it very clear that he had no life in the US. He wouldn't have a life in the US. And when he goes right. back to the US, he doesn't have a life. So. Um, I felt, you know, the opposite. Yeah, he's the tall guy that you can see. And I love the army shot um, when he's the last one in line and his head is, you know, this much higher. Um, but certainly, you know, and people who've seen this elsewhere know that our racism against black people is different. And often African-Americans feel much more at home in other cultures that have other races or populations that they tend to discriminate against more. Um, right. but certainly, I thought the U.S. was the place that he felt mm -hmm. he, he was really stunted and not Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, it's, yeah, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky question um, because I, I think you're right, Rachel. I, he, he, well, and I didn't think you missed anything. He doesn't come to terms, you know, with um, uh, or, or, or imagine anything remotely racist in Israeli society. On the contrary, I mean, he keeps praising how, you know, how wonderful Israel um, accepted him um, with open arms. 
Um, but I, you know, I do think it's an important aspect, and I, I do think it's a lingering question after the movie ends, maybe because it doesn't deal with it um, as much as it should. Um, we have, I mean, it's 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 very complicated on so many layers. I mean, first, it's just kind of uh, coming to terms, you know, the, the this impossibility of the expedited conversion um, that they had, you know, for for Perry and and this acceptance. You got to think that you know Ethiopian Jews, right, Black Jews that you know who for hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years practiced Judaism uh, in 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 Africa, only recently, uh, you know decades after moving to Israel, just now were acknowledged by the orthodoxy as, as real Jews. Osi Perry gets it, you know, overnight. Uh, but still, there's such um, a contrast between his immigration story and, you know, and for example, Tal Brody's story, right? Brody is, is, is an American Jew. He, he was already at the NBA, um, a, a pretty successful player, and, and they managed to, to, to recruit him to Maccabi. You know, they sent a delegate, uh, an, an Israeli delegate, official delegate, to, to recruit him to Maccabi in the name of Zionism. You know, I mean, Moshe Dayan told him how you know, important it is for the country, uh, 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 for the nation, for the spirit. Um, and also, I mean, they took him because he was a good player, right? Uh, and and then you got to ask, right, if if Olsi Perry really ever had a chance to fit in, you know, the movie shows it as as this anecdote, but um, you know, yeah, the conversion, the military, uh, these are rites of passage that they had him go through, right? Without these, nobody would have looked at him um, in Israel. And then you got to ask, is it believable that Olsi's drug problem, you know, went under the radar? I mean, the team must have known. So, so there's, there is a sense that they cared about him when he was a good player, right? But then, but then when he wasn't, they didn't need him anymore, unlike, you know, the, the Jewish basketball players, right, that they, they, import, they imported uh, uh, from, uh, from across the world. Um, uh, I one you know this doesn't come up in the film as well, but I, I saw this. Uh, I, I read this journalist who mentioned that uh, um, Tommy Ben Ami, uh, you know, the son says they didn't get married. They never got married because Olsi was sent to you know Olsi was sent to prison. But but this journalist said that many you know many of her friends mentioned that you know she she wouldn't ever have kids with with. Um, with Olsi Perry because they would come out, you know, because they would come out black. It, it was, you know, it wasn't, it, it was an impossibility in Israel of the, of, of the eighties to have um, um, uh, an interracial uh, kid, right? Um, so, so yeah, so, I mean, there's definitely this undertone. Did he run away from, you know, from the racism he faced back in America? Uh, to kind of face this, you know, maybe new, more subtle racism in, in the Middle East. Yeah, Norm. Oh, I was just going to say the Ethiopians don't have a jump shot, you know, and <laughs> um, it, it, there are these, uh, there are these figures, African-American figures in American sports who are truly crossover figures um, who, you know, Jordan, um, Magic Johnson, who just either understand how to market themselves or other people understand how to market them for sort of a crossover audience. And then there are the guys who can really play who really are not liked um, by white America, you know, um, you know, guys like Alan Iverson, uh, you know, we're just, we're just never popular. Um, um, and I, and I wonder um, if he was, if he was one of those guys, I, it, you know, it's 2020. So I, I don't think it's possible, at least for some of us to talk enough about race, but um, you know, it, it didn't, the, the film didn't really um, explore it that much in Israel. It seemed to me, it seemed, uh, you, you know, I, I, I wonder about, you know, the timing of the film and the, the, uh, you know the the increased uh, arguments on the European left and uh, on the American left that that Zionism is racism and and that whether this is not um, uh, a picture that that is not so. 
Um, but you really do have to wonder, you know, what, what did Israelis think? I, I have no idea. You know, what, what did Israeli think, think, Israelis think when he was, um, you know, dating the top supermodel in, in, in Israel? You know, what were they saying privately? You know, um, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting one way or the other. Um, but he, he was sort of this crossover, I, I see, it seems, this crossover celebrity athlete who, who managed to pull it off to a very large extent. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what my question is, but I, but I guess it, I, I guess, I guess it's along those lines. I, you know, obviously the fact that he's a sports figure helps in all of this and a successful sports figure at, the, at that, but, you know, I, I wonder how it really, whether you thought uh, the, the film really um, investigated the, the issue of, uh, of race in Israel in the 70s and 80s. Does that uh, make any sense? No, no, it does. No, I, 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 yeah, I definitely think this is uh, um, the director. Well, uh, Danny Menken, the, the director, he admitted that he is, um, you know, a sworn fan of Harry since childhood. And making a film about him was this long, um, uh, was this lifelong dream, dream, right? So, uh, so I think he 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 went on to portray his hero, right? Instead of film, you know, making um, uh, investigative uh, piece of uh, uh, um, documentary. Um, Man uh, the, the other film that Mankin uh, uh, um, directed is, is kind of breakout film was 39 Pounds of Love. I don't know if you heard about it, but it also made the, the festival circle. And you know, he follows the story of a young man who has muscular dystrophy and you know, he can only move one finger, but, but against all odds, right? He is a graphic designer and he goes on this journey to find the doctor who only gave him six months to live. So it's, it's a very moving, you know, film about the endurance of, of the human spirit. And I think Olsi is a similar film, right? It's, it's, it's less interested in kind of asking those questions, those hard questions about, about race, about Israeli society, about uh, uh, non-Jewish immigration um, to Israel. Um, and Mankin himself admitted that the film is too soft I, you know, in, in a number of interviews, um, but that's what he wanted. I mean, yeah. it, he, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, it, it, it might be okay. I mean, maybe we're, you know, we're just like a cynical movie critics here, right? Instead of uh, uh, going to, you know, for this big heart in, in the center of the film, um, which is a very much about um, second chances. But, but no, there's definitely many things that he miss uh, uh, tackling uh, with race. I, I think the other, you know, the, the other important aspect that kind of goes completely under the radar it's it's not even brought up. Tommy Benami. Um, Tommy Benami is a Mizrahi Jew. Uh, she she also comes from the margin. She was born in a small peripheral dead end town. Uh, um, her name was Tommy Ben Chemo. She changed her name into an Ashkenazi name. Um, so her story, you know, so, so this connection that she might have with, with Olsi Perry, right, both kind of coming from the margins, both being Jews of color, um, is, is, is completely uh, uh, disregarded. I did, did anybody have any thoughts about how the movie portrayed the relationship between them? Gail. Yeah. Um, it's, it, there's a question also, but um, yeah. so I, I thought that they actually sensationalized it as the first mixed couple, and 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 really tried to you know show that openness, that new vision. Um, but my question is directly related to norms and what you were talking about. My first question, which is um, when his friend says at the end, "You became one of us." He became one of us. I was curious how you read that. Was that an Israeli or was that because he became a Jew because he converted? So that's my first question, which is, you know, right in line with what you were saying. And my yeah. other is, you know, the two moments where they talk about circumcision. The first, he tries to give us this mystical, he does it, you know, in the animation with the drawing. You know, I found out later that I was really circumcised. And you see it with rabbis, not just a doctor in the hospital, but then he still has to be circumcised later. So yeah. I, I wanted to see what you thought of that. He became one of us, um, what that meant, and then how you read those circum his his own reading of that, you know, his mythology of his own circumcision. Yeah. Yeah, I, 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think I was also kind of baffled by his story of you know, being born in a, in a Jewish hospital. Some of the details didn't, didn't really connect. Uh, especially because he mentioned, I mean, well, yeah, circumcision, what I understand, circumcision wasn't that uh, um, common in the States back at that time, although it, it kind of is today. It, it still, was, it was. It was, yeah. But, you know, still the details didn't click because when you're, when you're circumcised in the hospital, they do it the, the next day. Um, and he said that the rabbis came to circumcise him the seventh day. And, and he was in a Jewish hospital. He was in Beth Israel. He was in a yeah, Jewish but, hospital. But, but he, he probably meant the eighth day. He didn't know. You know what? He didn't know. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I think yeah. So uh, yeah, even if it's a Jewish hospital, I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a medical procedure. You don't have rabbis come and, and do you know and do a circumcision. So I, I think yeah, he was sort of he was a bit mythologizing uh, uh, this um, uh, this story. Um, um, and, and and to answer your question, I, I well I think it goes some of it kind of goes back to you know Maccabi as being uh, a team with a nation you know it shows this power that um, that Maccabi Tel Aviv had it, it was an empire I mean a literally empire that 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 was what was they used to say and um, and and we see those powers through all these conversion you know this this express conversions uh, a conversion that he has. Uh, uh, to Judaism, uh, yeah. Uh, you, you see, there, there's a limit on on the number that uh, of foreign players, you know, uh, of foreign players you can have on a team, right? So Maccabi arranged to convert him to Judaism almost overnight, um, and and you really know what a complicated process it's, it's you know it's an almost impossible process to go through, like Orthodox conversion. Uh, um, you know, it's years and years of of, of studying and, and preparing, and here you have, you know, Maccabi, you know, get get they get the finest Brooklyn Orthodox rabbis uh, uh, um, to sign a certificate that you know even Moses can't can overturn. The guy, you know, the, the guy is Jewish and it's signed sealed, um, and it's not discussed in full in the film. And and I, you know, and I probably this is why you know you, you bring it up. They claim that Olsi found himself getting closer closer to Judaism, right? And they tell the story about the circumcision, circumcision but, but in reality, it was almost like, you know, a, a green card marriage, right? Uh, um, the, it was all for the sake of bringing Olsi to Israel as a Jew through the law of return so he can play and you can, so he could get citizenship and play in Maccabi Tel Aviv. And in Maccabi Tel Aviv, the team had the, you know, had this, this the power to do that. Um, so yeah, so although it's kind of portrayed in, in the film as this mystical, you know, magical circle uh, from being born in a Jewish hospital to uh, to having kind of circum second circumcision, it, it it wasn't really it wasn't really like that. Well, so if he was a citizen, then how was he um, expelled from the country for the drug offense? I, 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 yes, so I think this is this is a, another problem. Uh, um, with um, with the film kind of being too, I, I think too compassionate um, and and kind of brushing off you know, the the edges of his story, um, the journalist that found Olsi drugged out, you know, um, claimed that he was actually threatened that night uh, by Maccabi management to eighty six the story. I mean, they, they didn't let him say that Olsi was overdosing. I mean, they claimed it's tabloid material. So there's no, you know, the Hebrew press, I, I went through, yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I try to go through the archives. There is no story in, in the big papers about that night, about Olsi being drugged out. So we have this Sports Illustrated journalist, right, saying that a part of the deal, the sentence, in Israel was that he leaves. And yeah, I didn't understand how, you know, you can't make, like you say, you can't make an Israeli citizen leave uh, as a part of a bargain plea. And, and you know, and, and you think, why didn't Maccabi help him out? Why didn't they, why didn't they send him to rehab? So so anyway, it turns out that yeah, it's not exactly how it's portrayed. Perry was sentenced through to three months of parole um, and a fine. And, and you know, and, and again, this is kind of Maccabi management pulling the strings uh, because he, he was involved in a pretty serious uh, um, 
drug purchase uh, um, in Israel. So, so you know, so so the story was shushed, and there's hardly any mentioning in the press. Um, and and he left on his own accord. He, you know, he was he was uh, uh, paroled, retired, and only then he had the Amsterdam affair. Uh, so he wasn't exiled. He wasn't exiled or kicked out of Israel. It was his choice. Um, and and you know, yeah, it makes you think. I mean, is it because he was? The movie doesn't say that, but right, these are the lingering question. Is it because he was marginalized, right? Is like his falling into drugs, uh, was it because he was a spectacle, right? Is that part of the deal or, or do we have just, a, you know, somebody screwing up, making really bad choices? And the movie doesn't ask those questions. And um, yeah, it doesn't bring out, it doesn't bring out the details as they, as they were. Yeah, Jack. But I thought that, you know, what the movie does at least, it gives us an explanation and that is that you know, like many sports, uh, you know, people, that he was suffering from a great deal of pain from you know, yes. the various injuries he sustained. Um, and, you know, it's plausible to me. It may not be true, but I, I'll buy that. And, and many, many athletes become sort of drug addicts based, based upon the need for, to, you know, to maintain pain. And they go on to, you know, more steeper and steeper kind of uh, more and more addictive uh, medications. That's one thing. I do think that your story, uh, it's too bad it's not, it wasn't in the film because I, I think the story of, um, you know, the, the sort of mystical dimension of, of um, his Jewishness, um, you know, something that I think could have been played out a little bit more is quite fascinating. Um, and the, um, but I also think the, um, the, the uh, you know, the, one of the things that the film does not explore sufficiently, I mean, I think it's there, and that is the, um, the uh, you know, the, the adulation of a person, the sort of sports hero, and the kind of permission it gives to cross over certain boundaries, right. which, which I think is what would explain his relation with Tammy, why it wouldn't cause such a stir, despite the fact it's an international couple. And then added to the fact that she herself is black, is dark, you know, it's, so it already doesn't, you know, she, it's not like he's dating an Ashkenazit, right? She's, uh, she, so, you know, it's like, it, it's not entirely um, you know, creating a, uh, you know, a, a breaking of a racial boundary, just religious and ethnic, an ethnic boundary. I, I love the fact that they were able to um, uh, swiftly get him through the process of conversion. I find that absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and, and I think it, it's a limitation of the film that I didn't explore a little bit more the scandalous aspect of this, that even the rabbinate, you know, for a sports hero can be <laughs> bought. <laughs> and I think it makes it infinitely more interesting than just the adulation. So I, I, it's too bad. I mean, I think your take on it should have been integrated into the film. <laughs> Would have made me happier. So Roy, um, I don't know if you, what you thought or what anybody thought about um, the film as film. Um, I'm curious about that because I, I used to be someone who really did not like animation um, in docs. I'm, I've adjusted to it as most of you know, and, and some I've really come to like. In this one, I, I really didn't think it was successful. Um, I thought, uh, um, you know, some of the drawings were, sketches were interesting, but the animation I thought was strange. And I don't know if other people thought it was successful, didn't pay attention to it, tuned it out. Where, where were you on that? And the opening and closing frames, I thought, you know, weren't, I liked his face and I, you know, and, and the, the shots of him, um, but I just thought, you know, that closing frame was, um, Unfortunately, it, it wasn't as creatively done as in your film. That's true. I wasn't sure what I didn't like about it, but it has some strange movements. I don't know if you noticed where they were sort of abstracting, exploding, and and I just yeah. Did anybody? It was, jarring. It, was it was kind of jarring. I didn't care for right. it, and the color it wasn't good. And um, yeah, yeah that was a strange combo. Yeah. <laughs> Remember the the animator is uh, is uh, uh, the son of Perry's um, wife, so perhaps okay, a very talented Italian cousin who's <laughs> brought in to 
to help out the fills. And maybe, you know, maybe it was uh, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. There was these, there were these burn through animation things that I thought were kind yeah. of not attractive, you, you know. Yeah, whatever. that was what I was wondering since I'm trying to figure out a next project and you want to right. see what jars or what jars you. Can I ask you about that sun? Because that's what I found most disturbing coming from a family with multiple children where they're really careful. Um, the guy says that his you know, greatest dream was to meet his unknown daughter with all of these other children floating around. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if anyone else found that a little bit jarring, um, but you know, that was his dream. Um, rather than that whole life was my dream, it was my dream to go through this trajectory. I didn't know if anybody else found that odd, family people. Yeah, so I, um, I did, I did. And I think, again, it's a, it's a choice made by the film's director. I, I, I believe it was um, just a spur of the book. Uh, I also, in his private life, started going after his estranged daughter, trying, trying to locate her. And at the same time, they were filming the movie. So the director you know, said, "All right, let's let's try to incorporate it into the film." Um, and then he said, "He said he's a sucker for for American, you know, for American cinema." Uh, I think Spielberg's wife is is the producer. She is. She is. Uh, she's <laughs> so he's financing said, everything right now. <laughs> yeah. I think that's his sister, Spielberg's his sister. sister. Okay. It is. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. But it seemed like it was a little bit with the daughter. It would he felt more clean slate with him. I mean, he might have felt like he'd already sort of messed things i mean he had the boy for a little bit but it sounds like he didn't have him long term um and he didn't know the da daughter yet but um uh but oh back to the i was actually wanted to ask you about the the tammy um you know i didn't pick up on her being darker skinned I, I, maybe i couldn't see it that well and i don't know that passing is the word that i'm looking for but it seemed like she had successfully she was sort of uh, elite society of a certain kind. I mean, she was sort of that celebrity status. And um, so I could sort of- Beautiful people. Right, beautiful people status. So the fact that in a way um, her, her like sort of the idea that marrying somebody who was black might've been kind of repugnant to her or something. I mean, I, I sort of wonder, if, you know, her own, um, Sort of marginal status now because i'd assumed she was ashkenazi but mm -hmm. she sort of she sort of just got there herself because of like beauty and her height and you know being a model so he he was perhaps more risky to her just because her own grasp um uh gail looks like she's making a face of i don't buy that at all <laughs> oh yeah okay <laughs> Um, but, but that's how she, you know, that's how she seemed to me. Um, and so I, I wonder what you think about her position. Yeah, I know yeah, it's, it's hard. And so there, there's not, um, there's not much about her floating out there, uh, um, you know, on online besides glamour shots and, um, sort of male photographer saying how beautiful and exotic um, um, she was. Uh, so again, we know she was born um, Tami Ben Chemo, uh, and she changed her name. Um, but uh, you know, she she lived. Uh, she seemed to live a, a pretty private life when when not in in the picture frame, right? Um, so yeah, most most of the press we have about her um, is either her high profile relationship with Perry or you know, later her family feuds um, regarding her last will after she died of cancer in 95. Uh, and conveniently, you know, the, the, the one clip in the film that is, um, that is of her speaking, that interview is the one that's available on, on YouTube. So I, I don't think the director was either you know, interested or, or, or tried to dig around uh, that much to kind of uncover um, her, um, but yeah, she, I mean, she was a Mizrahi Jew, and it's it's poetic that she found Alsi, um, because even when photographers talk about her, they, you know, they, they actually they talk about her as uh, as a mulata. Uh, um, so her, you know, so her, her story and and Alsi story kind of intersect in like some very um, interesting ways. So maybe, maybe it's a new film project. I don't know if anybody looking for. <laughs> Right. Uh, if, if I could pick up on something that Rachel says, yeah. pick back onto it. 
So in a way, the way to look at it is that, you know, when you come from the periphery or you come from lower class or sort of an outcast in a certain kind of way, you're hyper conscious of whether you're moving up or moving down. And so clearly as a supermodel, she's, she's, been, she's moved up. And the same is true with Alsi, but when Alsi gets into drugs, he's no longer moving up, he's moving down. And there's, I, I'm just surmising. So the threat is there that he's gonna pull her down as well. And I think that's, I would guess that that's a huge dynamic in that relationship and, and a huge component of this film of how fragile uh, that kind of social mobility is uh, for various segments of the population. I'd like to follow up on something Rachel said too. No, my dog just needs to go out and I was trying <laughs> to <get> my daughter. <laughs> I, I I was very moved by the film actually, and I saw a universality there. Um, every country has stars that um, are are um, extolled because they're stars, and then drugs often go with stardom, and um, then the people themselves don't really have a real life. The the son even made some comment about how they couldn't even have dinner in peace. Um, and, and I think every country who has, who deals with stars of that sort, they see this kind of a problem. It's a tragedy. Uh, and drugs are often part of the scene, whether it's in Israel or the United States. So um, I, I found this to be a very human film um, and a film of, um, uh, of, of, he had the, Aldi had a, a real insight into where he messed up and he confessed that, you know, and he said he wished he could do things over again or differently. Um, and, and one can identify with a lot of those emotions. And I, I, I saw the race issue um, in a different way too, because I grew up right not too far away from Newark in the 60s. And I remember those days of, of violence and racism and, and, and Newark was a horrible city in those days. Um, and, and, and the film portrays, I think, Newark pretty realistically from the 60s and, and actually was not very kind to the United States in general, if you look at the prison situation and so forth. So Israel comes out a lot better, whether it should or not, I don't know, but I thought that was an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, the, uh, the other race point I wanted to make before was just, I thought I saw it um, popping up a bit when I think there was in that one of the Jewish comedies from the 70s, there was a line about like, we yeah. should back to Yemenite on top of each other. And I mean, I guess that's where Tammy to me escapes being, she's not that kind of non-Ashkenazi. Um, and I, and I, I don't think Israel was at the stage yet, you know, at that point in the 70s or 80s where they, they felt there's something wrong with the way we're marginalizing. I mean, now we're all very sensitive about not being Ashka normative, especially in Jewish studies. So that's probably why it really stuck out to me. But um, yeah, it was kind of interesting to hear that. Yeah, and I, you know, and Tommy's uh, um, rise to fame um, uh, goes against the narrative. Uh, she, she was famous in Israel and, and then later around the world in Europe because she challenged the sort of, uh, you know, the Western, the Western notion of, of beauty, right? Uh, models before her in Israel were all blonde, blue eyes. Um, and suddenly, yeah, you have this girl who's, uh, who's you know, darker skin, skin uh, uh, and complexion and, and the more mysterious and exotic uh, uh, persona. That's how, that's how the you know, photographers describe her. Uh, this is one of the, 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 one of the things that put her up on, on the stage. Um, Wasn't this also post Black Panther explosion a little bit? So she would be idealized yeah. as breaking that glass ceiling too. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can only assume. Um, and, I, and, I, and again, I, I wish that I wish the film had you know, uh, dealt a little more with that. I, I, I think a lot of those, you know, personal relationship that Osi had. Um, were yeah we're, we're a bit missed in, in, in the movie. I mean, uh, uh, the son, right, uh, Perry Jr., uh, um, kind of wanting answers. You know, the, the American family, um, the ex-wife. Uh, they seemed like uh, uh, really great characters that could shed so much light, you know, on, on the complexity of um, 
of Aussie's life and the connection between right, Israel and America, the, the life between Israel and America, and, and didn't come out as much, um, I thought. Um, but I also get it was it was yeah. It, I, I mean, some parts were were truly emotional um, to watch. I think it was it was um, you know, not not because of the you know this this sort of happy ending or candy wrapped ending. I, I think what got to me most is, is kind of the the neglect that uh, Perry that Olsi Perry suffered when when in prison. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed that. I, I think this is also one of the things that the movie kind of <laughs> tries to get over with pretty quick. But but literally no one came to visit Perry, you know, during that that almost a decade that he spent um, in jail. Um, you know, his closest friends, uh, Shamluk, uh, the, you know, the, this father figure um, that's in the center of the film. You know, uh, I mean, he almost says there that uh, that that Olsi was dead to him. You know, once once he got you know once he, he, he got into prison um how, I mean, yeah how, how do you do that how do you it's like it's like that we have a colleague who's in prison for a very 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 long time and none of us have gone to see him i included um yeah, I mean, that was actually the point that what I was thinking of when I made my comment in the beginning about his insiderness or outsiderness, because I was struck. And also when I guess it was, was it Shemluk, that guy who said yeah. I could have killed him? I mean, yeah. maybe maybe he would have said that about an Israeli who had done that too, but it seemed <laughs> very strong. And I guess I just felt like um, Olsi, I mean, I, I feel like there's no way he couldn't have been hurt that he might have that he was deserted in in like his darkest moment right so you know that's the kind of thing where you feel like you, I, I think you'd feel i thought i was an insider but would they have done you know i don't know maybe they would have been the same way to an israeli who had sort of but Rachel, he would also be suffering from a great deal of shame and i'm not so sure how much you'd want to see them Oh, he he disappointed everybody. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, so he comes out in this film as you know, kind of he has this reserved, holistic, you know, point of view to everything that happened in his life. Um, but, but somebody interviewed him when he was uh, he was in prison. Um, a, a, a Israeli journalist came to the states to to talk to uh, to Olsi Perry, and he found you know, and and, and you see this. Um, this really broken, forsaken man. Um, mm. The reporter that came to visit spent seven hours with him. So they gave, you know, they gave this guy seven hours. So I thought maybe there's visiting limitations. Maybe they couldn't come to visit, right? But this guy gets seven hours. And also he wants to spend, you know, the, the entire seven hours with him talking uh, about what happened to him. Uh, um, and no one else from from you know, and, and we get this downbeaten image, you know, lonely figure that that no one else from the team or from Israel, right, the place that was his home, came to visit. You know, only his American family, only his family came uh, uh, came to visit. And and you see, you also see the differences between the response of you know, the, the yeah, the sister gets so emotional, the son, and then you have these reserved responses from you know from Maccabi from the Maccabi team. Uh, um, so this was tragic, and uh, and I think a too fast of the trans of a transition, right, uh, in the film, like from those ten years he spent in jail, straight to kind of reconciliation um, and closure. And I think the guys in Israel felt bad. Uh, I, 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 you know, they they definitely felt bad because when he moved, uh, right, you see how everybody embraces him. They they raised a lot of money. Uh, they helped. It. They 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 donated money for him to open. Uh, a sort of a, a local restaurant chain uh, to manage a, a, a restaurant chain, uh, Burger Burger Ranch, it was called. Uh, so, so I think I think they feel you know, I think that they felt guilt. That there was definitely something there. Um, he he managed a, a one part of the chain or the whole chain. So no, so it was just a, it was a manager of a, of a branch in Tel Aviv mm -hmm. um, uh, when he came back to Israel. Yeah, now and now you know, and now he works um, in Maccabi Tel Aviv again, uh, um, coaching coaching kids. And um, yeah, another thing I kind of baffled he does it for because he needs the money. Right? He 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 doesn't have any money. He, he said that um, 
he got about eighty thousand dollars a season back back in the day, which is probably what you know a basketball player in Israel now makes in in in, in a month, you know, in, in a month, in a week or a month. Um, uh, yeah, so so he, yeah, so so he needs he needs he needs the work to to sustain. Um, it, it's not an uncommon sports story, by the way. Really? Yeah, look at the stories of boxers. People made a fortune, you know, uh, in in various sports. And they lost it all in one way or another. It's a typical story. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, any other um, any other thoughts? Things you want to talk about? Um, Sorry, I should have said. I, I should have said that it's not just a sports story. It's a story of the, of the Galaterati, and uh, you know how they they get propelled to fame and wealth, and they often lose so much of it so quickly. And drugs often is a factor in it. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, I, I think on the you know on the African American front, um, even if even if we don't have a uh, close examination of of, of racism um, in Israel, I, I think you definitely see you know the kind of the baggage of of the double consciousness, um, right? Following, uh, following also you know, uh, the African American uh, uh, community throughout their their life, sort of uh, globally, right? So even even in Israel, he he was it was a spectacle uh, uh, for everybody to watch, um, knowing that he you know, always conscious of his you know of his own uh, uh, black body of of his own otherness, right? Seeing. Uh, seeing himself through through the eyes of the fans, right? Seeing himself through the eyes of the people uh, um, that surround him, um, and, and and yeah, it must have been you know, it must have been a tough burden to carry. But he's still alive. He's still in Israel. And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's, the movie's uh, you know, it's, it's pretty new. Um, uh, um, uh, Sherlock, uh, from Luke died. Um, so that, that famous uh, manager died just about a month after they wrapped up production. Um, so I, th I think this is also one of the reasons why you know, the director wanted to keep this decorum throughout the film, right? To, to have a film with respect and not, not something too, too biting. Uh, yeah, but he's still alive and well. Um, most chances that if you spent a month in Tel Aviv, you will run into Ossi Perry at one point. Mm -hmm. Uh, going and uh, walking, walking on the street. Um, yeah, he's, he's alive as well, um, uh, um, and uh, he's still a very much loved, you know, loved and cherished figure um, in Israel. Mm -hmm. and, and and you see that now he has right, this this kind of um, small uh, uh, family family uh, family mm -hmm. life. Lighting the Shabbat candles, eating, uh, eating breaking bread. <laughs> so it's, 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 a, it's a pretty, yeah, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good ending uh, to I think to this to this long story. Uh -huh. And the good endings of the film festivals, well, <laughs> it, now because it's nicely framed with Golda on one end and Alsi on the other end. I, so I, I think it's a good note to, uh, to end this discussion. Yes. yes, I think the filmmakers for all see were kinder than the filmmakers for Golden. <laughs> any of that. Mm. Well, thank you, Roy, and, and thank, you. thank you everybody for attending. Ah, oh, Virginia's back, and and um, <laughs> I, I hate to be redundant, but I have to be. I, I want to thank um, Virginia once again. I want to thank Jack once again. I want to thank Gail once again for the screening. Um, it, uh, Roy was right. It, it was a very nice uh, event, not just a nice remote event. Um, and we may be doing it again next time. Uh, only, only time and Pfizer will, will tell on that. So um, we will just have to see. But everybody, um, 
do uh, do um, uh, keep an eye out for our emails and our announcements. Uh, we, we do have a slate of events in the spring um, that I think you'll like. Um, so we'll keep in touch with you and, and please do keep in touch with us and we will see you soon. Everybody. Oh, 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 wait. Tomorrow night is the first night of Hanukkah, right? So <laughs> um, as Gail just reminded us, uh, uh, happy Hanukkah to everybody um, and yeah. all the best. Uh, Samayak Hanukkah. Samayak. <laughs> and and Norm, you'll bring you'll be bringing latkes to all of our homes, right? Yes, yes, I'll be I'll be <laughs> I'll be I'll be bringing latkes to everybody. If I don't have your email address, just send it to me in the chat really quickly. <laughs> oh wait, I can't get them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.